Last week, Steve for the third time tried to tackle the subject of GPU-bound CPU testing and how utterly pointless and misleading it is, but ended up blowing it out to an almost 40 minute long video, which let's be honest, most people aren't going to watch, at least not entirely. So I suggested let's make a short 10 minute video, threw myself in the deep end there because he threatened to fire me. So here I am. So today I have a summary version for you presented by me, Balin, the hardware unbox video editor, uh, the guy that puts the wrong polls up on screen every now and again and does some B-roll on the side. And it was signed off by a slightly, potentially very fed up Steve. Now, for those of you who did watch the previous video, thanks for that, uh, but there is some new info here for you. So it's probably worth watching. But before we get into that, Today's sponsor spot is brought to you by MSI and their GeForce RTX 40 series graphics cards, including the brand new Wukong edition RTX 4070 Super. This special edition model is based on MSI's gaming slim design, meaning it occupies just two expansion slots. And because this is the Wukong edition, it comes with a stunning custom design shroud and backplate, along with upgraded Torx 5.0 fans and tri Froza 3 cooling. NVIDIA's Ada Lovelace GPUs are the best way to enjoy ray tracing with improved, more realistic visuals and lighting in the latest and greatest games like Black Myth Wukong, Alan Wake 2 and Cyberpunk 2077. Plus, there's support for AI-powered DLSS 3 frame generation and reflex. So for more information, please check the links in the video description. Now we often see comments like, I just want to see how it performs at 4K, is there a difference? But these sort of commenters seem unaware that one person's 4K is not another person's 4K. For example, if you require a minimum of 60 FPS, like some single player gaming, for the most part you need not to worry about CPU performance. But if you game at 4K and you do require 144 FPS, you almost certainly will want the best CPU you can afford. In either case, you can work out the true capability at a resolution such as 1080p, whereas you simply can't at 4K. Also, in terms of real-world performance, most gamers who game at 4K don't do so at the native resolution. Rather, they enable FSR, DLSS, or XESS using either the performance, balanced, or quality preset. We recently polled this with over 30,000 of you, and I'll actually put the right one on screen this time, and 80% of those who voted said they do use upscaling. So you'll see from our previous results that we included 4K DLSS balanced results. Also, as recently pointed out by Gamers Nexus, a lot of strategy and turn-based games are heavily CPU limited, and therefore don't care what resolution is used for testing. They noted that Stellaris will take 25.8 seconds using the 9800X3D at both 1080p and 4K, so that's worth keeping in mind. Now for this video, we will be reusing our data from the previous video, but we will be adding a native 4K results line using the 9800X3D to visually reiterate the point that reporting native 4K and upscaled 4K data points still provides us with zero information about actual CPU performance. Alrighty, let's get into the results. So first up, we have Star Wars Jedi Survivor, and at 1080p, the performance of the 285K and 7700X is much the same, while the 9800X3D is brutally fast, allowing for 234 FPS, making it 51% faster. What this data tells us is that when placed under a heavy gaming load, the 9800X3D can deliver 51% more performance, which is obviously a substantial increase, and while not particularly useful in this example, it almost certainly will be in the future. Now initially, in Steve's first video, we tested at 4K with DLSS balanced upscaling enabled, and found that 9800X3D is just 16% faster. So there is a performance benefit even under real world conditions. When we test at 4K native though, the 9800X3D, despite currently being the world's fastest gaming CPU, caps out at 89 FPS. Now this is because we're placing the GPU under a heavier load, resulting in a GPU bound scenario and is hence useless for determining any given CPU's potential. If you only want to play Star Wars Jedi Survivor at 89 FPS, then this tells you that any of these CPUs will work, but it's useless information if you're willing to downgrade visuals in search of higher frame rates. So as the previous video showed, GPU performance does scale massively with quality settings. CPU performance though, not so much. The results in The Last of Us Part 1 is what I think people who claim low resolution CPU testing is bad for whatever reason, want to see. Here we see that the 9800X3D is 16% faster than the 7700X at 1080p, but just 1.4% faster at 4K using upscaling. And therefore, the 9800X3D is pointless and offers 4K gamers nothing. Don't buy it. But in this example, at least with the CPUs we're looking at, the 4K data doesn't provide any true indication of CPU potential. 
and the native 4K results make this even more problematic, showing a maximum of 90 FPS. So that's even more useless information if you're planning on tuning the quality settings for 140 FPS, as an example. Admittedly, this does let you know that upgrading from a 7700X to a 9800X 3D probably won't actually result in 16% greater performance in The Last of Us Part 1 across all resolutions. But again, this should be pretty obvious. The 7700X is spitting out 179 FPS on average at 1080p. So if you're happy with 140, 100, or any figure below what we see at 1080p in frames per second, then the data is going to be GPU limited, not CPU limited. Now, a seriously CPU demanding modern title where the 4K argument just falls apart, and I mean genuinely falls apart, is Hogwarts Legacy. At 1080p, the 9800X 3D was an unbelievable 37% faster than the 7700X and 43% faster than the 285K. Pretty impressive stuff. And if we increase the resolution to 4K with upscaling enabled, the 9800X 3D is still 33% faster than the 7700X and 35% faster than the 285K. So still huge margins. Having said that, if we add in the limits of the RTX 4090 at 4K without upscaling, we find that it caps out at 114 FPS, which was the limit of the 285K. So if you are happy with 114 FPS, then any of these CPUs will do the job. But if you actually want 144 FPS, you need to have something more powerful like the 9800X 3D. So after all of that, if the addition of 4K native data still hasn't convinced you, let's look at the older CPU data that we discussed in the previous video, which many people found eye-opening. This included the Ryzen 9 3950X, Ryzen 5 5800X, and Ryzen 7 5800X 3D, all of which were GPU limited at 4K in older games. Steve has been asked frequently since the dawn of time, which one should I buy, and which one will stand the test of said time? He was often met with the more causes better argument when he'd suggest the 5800X 3D. But now here we are in 2024, in three games watching the 5800X 3D absolutely slaughter the other two CPUs when it comes to gaming. Originally, we compared these CPUs at 1080p using the RTX 3090 Ti, which was the flagship used for testing back in 2022. But for the sake of the argument, we are going to show you the 4K data first with the added line for where the 4K native results are. Now, if like me, you had absolutely zero knowledge about the hardware or were PC illiterate, you would assume that all three parts offer the same performance for this specific game. From there, you'd hopefully search for another graph that offers some data points that differentiate them other than the obvious thing, price. Funnily enough, the 1080p data actually does this for you, taking most of the guesswork out of trying to figure out the possible performance differences between parts. In this example specifically, the 5800X 3D is 21% faster than the 5800X, and 36% faster than the 3950X. So the 4K native result changes absolutely nothing here. And even if the initial video showed 4K native data, the results that followed still would have told you nothing, other than the previous point we just spoke about. Now let's move on to some CPU limited modern games that we use for testing, one of which being Starfield, which has various MPC heavy sections of the game. Both the 1080p and 4K results show a stark difference to what we saw in the Watch Dogs Legion example, with both the 3950X and 5800X completely CPU bottlenecked, and we're almost seeing that with the 5800X 3D as well. Now if we add our native 4K line using the 9800X 3D, we can see that 81 FPS on average is the limit, and this is very clearly due to our GPU being the bottleneck. The Ryzen 7 5800X and even the tried and true 5800X 3D would achieve 81 FPS or thereabouts using these quality settings with an RTX 4090. We can also see the exact same thing in Space Marine 2. We found in our previous explanation video that at 4K, the 5800X 3D is 24% faster than the 5800X and a massive 46% faster than the 3950X. So what happens if we again place our native 4K line where we use the fastest gaming CPU available, the Ryzen 7 9800X 3D? Yep, you guessed it, reduced FPS shrinking the margin between the 5800X 3D and the 5800X to just 3%. So how could you possibly know? If we were to test at 4K native, how much more gaming performance the 5800X 3D can truly offer? Then finally, we have Star Wars Jedi Survivor, another CPU demanding game. And while the 3950X and 5800X still perform quite well here, the 5800X 3D blows them out of the water, offering 38% more performance than the 5800X at 4K, and 49% more than the 3950X. 
For the third and final time, we'll add our 4K native line again and see where we end up. Now the absolute ceiling when it comes to achievable average FPS in this title at 4K native with the quality settings in the header at the top of the screen is 89. Ouch. So this average graph looks a lot different. And although this data is only based on an extremely small sample of games and the games picked are deliberately CPU demanding, it's not like we're using competitive shooters. At 4K, the 5800X3D was on average 25% faster than the 5800X and 44% faster than the 3950X. And those are some seriously significant margins. Of course, Steve was testing with an RTX 4090, but you'd see similar margins with an RTX 4070 Super, for example, if you were to dial the quality settings down a little bit. So coming away from all of this testing, I think it's important to realize that the frame rate and margins between the processors is really what matters, not the resolution. This is because GPU limiting performance to 60 FPS or even 90 FPS just isn't useful for someone who wants 120 FPS when they're gaming. Just the other day, Steve made a post on X, which seemed to help quite a few people who were trying to work out if they should upgrade their CPU. So maybe I'll just read that out. So what you do is this, find a review or benchmark that compares the performance of your CPU against the 9800X3D at a low CPU bound resolution. Then see what frame rate each CPU delivered. Then see what FPS your GPU can deliver under your desired conditions. For example, if your CPU can throughput 80 FPS and the 9800X3D can throughput 150 FPS, but your GPU can only deliver 70 FPS under the settings that you deem fit for use, and you're happy with that, then the 9800X3D won't offer you anything in that example right now. But if you want 140 FPS and you're willing to reduce visuals in order for your GPU to hit the 140 FPS, then the 9800X3D will be a massive upgrade. It seems to me that a big part of this issue is down to people not fully understanding what a CPU review is. It's not an upgrade guide, rather it evaluates the performance of the part in question, giving you a clear understanding of what it offers in terms of performance and how that stacks up when calculating stuff like cost per frame. This is useful because you shouldn't be upgrading unless you need to. So if, for example, you upgraded from a 7700X to a 9800X3D, and saw no performance increase in the games you're playing, that's really on you. You probably didn't need to upgrade and spend your money, so you shouldn't have. But if the 7700X was limiting your performance, and this was determined by looking at GPU utilization, then you would see performance increases, and that increase would continue to be realized over time as games continue to become more CPU demanding. Now, as a side note, CPU utilization is a useless metric for gaming, as you can be 100% CPU limited in an example where CPU usage is only reported to be 40%. Now, this is because CPUs are different to GPUs. A CPU core is much larger, and they are designed to handle a more general range of tasks, and the cores can end up being limited by something else, such as cache or DRAM bandwidth, as an example. So it's always best to monitor just the GPU usage. Anyway, that's gonna do it for today's video. Uh, hopefully I did a reasonable job at being Steve for the day. If you found it useful and enjoyed it in any way, please feel free to drop a like, comment and subscribe. That would be super appreciated. And if you wanna go even further than that, uh, which would be amazing, I might keep my job, um, subscribe to the Patreon where you'll get access to Q and A's, uh, live streams, uh, behind the scenes content, Discord server, some really cool stuff, but yeah. I probably won't see you in the next one, but thanks for watching. See you one day in the future, maybe.